How to become the number one real estate agent in the world. That's no joke. That's today's show. Let's dive into it. Here we are at our very first rental property. Hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris. Welcome to the show. I am super excited to invite you into the Investing in Real Estate show and we've got a great guest on the show today. He has been recognized as the number one real estate agent in the world. He's done, I think, over a billion dollars worth of sales. He has done 500 rental properties on his own and guess what? He struggled with a learning disability when he was first starting out in school, managed to overcome that and focus on real estate and real estate investing as the number one way to build wealth for he and his family and to help his other real estate agents. My guest is Pat Hyben. Welcome to the show, Pat. Great to see you here. You've had me on your show a couple of times. Yeah, thanks, Clayton. Great to be on. Well, real thrilled to have you joining us. First of all, tell our audience uh, where you're coming in from. I understand you live on a bit of an island somewhere. <laughs> so that's pretty, <laughs> you sound like Richard Branson. Where where are you? And uh, tell us a little bit about your history. I I, I live in uh, Folly Beach, uh, South Carolina. It's a uh, it's a six mile island. There's a bridge to get there, but you know it's um, uh, and the reason I brought that up is because we were having some internet issues earlier, and um, but. Uh, uh, I'm from Maryland. I was born in uh, Columbia, Maryland, which is a suburb of Baltimore, and uh, basically spent my first 50 years there. Um, and I once I got out of real estate sales and was able to live comfortably off of the horizontal income or the passive income from real estate investing, uh, we decided we could live anywhere. And my wife loves the beach, and so we moved to a beach town and that's where I am today. That's fantastic. So I mentioned the beginning that you were recognized, well, as the number one real estate agent in the world by Keller Williams. I mean, that's an amazing distinction, but you've now moved on beyond real estate sales. So something clicked for you and you made that transition. But take me back to those days when you were a real estate agent. How in the world did you get to that level? If we have real estate agents watching right now who want to learn how to you know, geometrically grow their business, what would you suggest that they do? Well, geometrically growing the business, I, I, I think, you know, obviously you can't grow to the level where we were, where we had we had a large team. We had 50 some people on the team um, and, and, and we weren't able to do, I wasn't able to leverage the way I leveraged without a team, without building a company, you know, so to speak, um, instead of just doing agent sales. If I'm going to do agent sales all by myself, I'm going to be able to do maybe 40 max a year. We were able to do over 500 a year, several years in a row. And, um, and we just did it one at a time. I, uh, luckily, I started when I was 21 years old. Um, and so, you know, every year I would try to do more and more and I would leverage more and more. Um, and there was some luck in that, you know, we, I had been one of the first agents who actually in our area decided to build a team and to have other people working with them. Uh, and make profits on other people uh, with a team, with a real estate team. And uh, when the market started going really well in 2001 or so, we already had a surfboard built and we were able to ride the wave on that surfboard that we built uh, that, uh, mo that no one else really had. And uh, so that was really fun. And that's kind of how we did it. And then, then, then shortly thereafter, I wrote my book, Six Steps to Seven Figures, which uh, went on to become a New York Times bestseller. And uh, that was a fun experience as well. And uh, once I got back from book tour from that, uh, I just decided to become a real estate investor and kind of get out of the game of, of people, you know, and <laughs> get more right. in the game of investments. So we talk about that because you go on this book tour, Gary Keller writes the, what the introduction to the book, right? Six steps uh, to seven, uh, six steps to seven figures, right? right? And he writes the introduction. You say, you know what? I'm just tired. 
And that's kind of, I went through a similar thing and I'm just like, I'm tired. I just want to start building that passive income. But it's amazing to me that you were helping other people, I think, build up passive income for so long by doing all these real estate deals as an agent. Did you ever like kick yourself when you're doing all these deals? You even had like 14 closings in one day at one point where you say, man, I'm making all these other people wealthy. Yeah. You know, I, you know how stockbrokers always talk about dollar cost averaging? Right. I think we should dollar cost average really uh, with real estate. You know, um, people out there, agents out there, they should be buying at least a house a year. I think I do look back, especially during the 90s, right? I got licensed in 1987. So all through the 90s, the real estate market didn't change. There was no ups and downs. Um, and I could have easily bought a house a year and had a ton more houses than I do or did. Um, and dollar cost average, if I had dollar cost average the house every year from 1987 till now, you know, I'd have a massive uh, portfolio of single families. And so, uh, I, you know, that would be my advice to people is yes, there is some regret there. I think that especially during the times when nothing happens um, is, is where the dollar cost averaging of houses really pays off. Right. You, you have access as an agent to be able to go out and find those deals. I mean, you're getting listings that are coming in that other people just don't even have access to. So you're kind of sitting there on a little bit of a gold mine. Um, let's talk now about your strategy for investing. So you make that switch. You decide, you know what, I'm going to leave this sales world. I'm going to get out of the, the people business, so to speak, and start to focus on building up my own portfolio of properties. How did you start to begin to find those initial properties? Was it through your own brokerage, deals coming in? And what were your what was your criteria on the properties you were purchasing? Well, um, so yes, in the beginning it was all through, well, I wouldn't say it was all through, but it was through referrals and houses that came across my plate. I, I actually bought four houses in like 2000 at the University of Maryland that uh, was referred to me by another agent in like Alabama. And it was just a fluke thing to the universe. I got this referral. He said, I got a little lady. She has four houses. She wants to sell all near all next to each other. Um, and uh, I looked at it and I was like, I'm going to buy these myself. And uh, that's how I ended up with those. Uh, the, um, but yeah, I mean, my board of what I looked for was, of course, in the beginning, I think I went by the 1% rule. Um, and then after that, uh, you start chasing a little higher returns. You get kind of a little more serious on on what your returns need to be. Um, technical terms, you know, probably a, a 15% IRR. I mean, a 15% cash on cash. And then, uh, you know, 20 plus internal rate of return with, with disposition, if you're going to sell it, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I'm, am I answering your question? Yeah. And it has that shifted over time. So what types of properties, is it multifamily, single family storage facilities? You bought those ones near, uh, university of Maryland. Is that indicative of your larger portfolio? Um, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I bought a bunch and I've sold a bunch. I think I have 12 now in Maryland that, that I just rent. Um, some are college student rentals. Some are Section 8 in Baltimore City. Uh, I have six apartment buildings that uh, have either as little as three investors or as much as, say, 20-some investors. I have a shopping center, um, and that would be it. Several notes. You, you sound know. like you sound like my portfolio. Several notes, yeah. some apartment yeah. complexes, bunch of single <laughs> families. It's a good grab bag of stuff. Um, yeah. And take me back to those first deals when you were 
how are you putting the money together on these things? Because it sounds like you have investor partners that you've partnered with on other deals, but take me through some of the first deals. And so if our audience is watching right now, how can they take action if they're just getting started? What would you recommend maybe hindsight 2020 on how you might structure things? Well, I, I always structured it in traditional methods. You know, I, I, I would get a, a 15 or 30 year mortgage and put 20% down. Um, I didn't do much creative stuff where it was where I was taking a lot of risks. Um, and of course, the rents would always pay the mortgage for me. Um, yeah, it's different with partners and apartment buildings and things like that. But um, I think if you stick to that, that sort of uh, financing, uh, you really can't go wrong, um, especially when the market changes. Especially now, I mean, if you, to to be able to lock into a five percent rate for thirty years is is just astronomical that you can do that. Um, and a lot of the commercial loans and other venues out there, you know, want you to balloon in five years or three years or seven years, and everything's going to be different then. So uh, my recommendation is, that, yeah, if you can get a traditional mortgage, which you should be able to get ten of them, you know, with Fannie Mae guidelines. Um, mm -hmm do it by all means do it right so now people hit up against that 10 right have you done anything interesting where you've taken those properties and you've rolled them out of your personal name and into an llc because again you know we encourage so many people here on the, the channel to make sure that they're buying properties in an entity so that they're not going to get sued later if a tenant slips and falls and they get to come out to your own personal assets how did you handle that dynamic um so that's a great question and the the tricky part in that is is getting the loan because it's in an llc and it can be done but you got to find the right bank so what i did is i I like the rule of thumb of about a million dollars per LLC, right? Um, I, I don't believe you should put a $50,000 house in an LLC and then get another LLC, another LLC. Maybe you do. But but the problem, the challenge with that is it's $300 a year. You got to file a tax return on each one. It just becomes a major pain in the ass. So, you know, I put about a million in properties or things per LLC. And then, then what happened is I... Um, uh, I went to get a loan against all the houses, right? Like one big group loan against all the houses. And I got one, but I did have to look around. It was difficult. I, I went with a local bank. Uh, local banks seem to, you know, be a little more liberal when it comes to that. Um, I got a million dollar loan, uh, actually on those 12 properties I mentioned, I got a million dollar loan, five, I just refinanced it. When I first got it, it was a five year loan at 5.29. I just refinanced it because it just came due at 5.75 for another five years. And that's a fixed rate. Um, you know, so 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 does that answer the question <laughs> yeah it does again <laughs> it, it's not you know it's an art i mean what you're saying at the end of the day it's you know there's a science to it but there, it's also an art and it's a matter of trying to move these pieces around that make sense and you know there's not one size fits all approach for everyone you know you you believe in about a million dollars in one llc i kind of stick to the 250-ish range for LLCs, um, 250,000 in value. For me, that could be five properties. It could be one property, you know. So I kind of mix it up a little bit. And then, yeah, we're currently doing some refinances on some properties, pulling some equity out. I mean, we bought them with cash and now we're putting some notes on those and, and rolling that into some other properties. I don't think there's any one way to do it, right? No, and it depends on the times too, because you can do that now, but five years ago, or even say eight years ago, you probably wouldn't have been able to do it. The banks wouldn't have given you that commercial loan. So, right. um, yeah, they so weren't. I mean, if they, if you had an LLC, they were saying, sorry, we're not going to even talk with you. But I think the banks have started to realize that there's all those sort of crowdfunding and other platforms that have started emerging. And so for commercial lending has now taken off for these crowdfunding sites and all these banks are left sitting there holding the bag. They're saying, wait a second, 
we have money. <laughs> Why are right. we lending to these people? Why, you know, these are the people that are actually generating money here. The, you know, why are we just, uh, you know, offering loans on eighty thousand dollar houses to uh, to a husband and a wife? We should be out there in this in this field. So I think they've started to loosen a lot of that. You're right. Yeah, and that and also that market exploded, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, real estate as a respected asset class is at an all time high. I mean, they. they 10 years ago, even 10, especially 10 years ago, but even 20, 30 years ago, um, very few people saw anything real estate related as a respectable industry. Like very few people did it and, and uh, not sales, I mean, investing. Um, and if you, I, I can remember going to probably 12 years ago or more, I went to a local bank and I said, I want a million dollars so I could flip houses. And the guy looked me in the eye and said, we don't like that word. You can't use that word. So flipping, if you remember, used to be like a negative thing. It right. was like, it was like associated with greed. You know, which doesn't make any sense thing. because here you're taking a rundown property, which is what we do at our company, right? We buy up properties that no one wants to touch. We rip them apart, put them back together. We're just working on one yesterday. I was in the middle of a show and I got a call from a contractor to go over this uh, this big project we're working on. And all the plumbing is done. I mean, and it's in a historic area. So this was a total rundown place. Now it's gonna be totally revitalized in this area. All new drywall, everything's gonna be done. Electric plumbing, new roof, windows. So. I don't know why it's got a, such a negative connotation, but you're revitalizing neighborhoods by doing that work. Yeah, I mean, it's much better now because you've had 35 different shows on all the TV stations about house flippers um, that have, have taken off and people fall in love with the characters and things like that. Uh, but really, before, before the popularity of it on TV, the banks and, and, and the general public kind of looked down on it for whatever reason they, they saw it as, you know, a bad thing to do. Right. Talk about your university. Tell us about your university and how you help aspiring real estate agents. We mentioned obviously being named the number one agent in the world. That's what you now help other agents do. And we have a lot of real estate agents that watch our show uh, that uh, certainly uh, comment and listen and uh, interact with us. So tell us about the university. And we'll have a link below this so people can subscribe and, uh, and join your university. I appreciate you putting that link and, and what people can do. The cool thing that, that I'm going to do for people watching this and listening to this is uh, I'm going to give away a copy of my book for free, uh, Six Steps to Seven Figures. If you went on Amazon, uh, barnesandnobles.com right now, you pay full price for it plus shipping. Um, and uh, plenty of people do that every day. It's still sold very well. Um, and uh, so we're going to give a copy away for free with your link. And if you follow that link, it will also give you an opportunity to uh, have a significant discount on all of the courses, all 18 courses. And by the way, we have five courses on real estate investing from everything from, you know, flipping houses to Airbnb rentals to uh, syndicating apartments and creating a, a private equity fund, all, if you want to go that far, uh, all included so it's all right there on the link that clayton's provided and worst case scenario is you get a free book all you gotta do is pay the shipping and you're all set that's awesome and so if you're listening to the show right now and not watching the link will be we're going to set it up very simply for you it's morrisinvest.com slash pat morrisinvest.com slash pat will get you access get you the free book from pat very kind of him to put that up there for you guys and also then if you want to take a look at some of the courses if you're a real estate agent you want to learn how to flip houses um, or airbnb which has been a hot topic here on our channel as well so dive into all of that again morrisinvest.com slash pat and we'll have it in the description below before we get you out of here pat we have a lot of new newbies who are just getting started looking to take action in real estate investing um, what advice would you give to them if they are sitting on the fence and looking for excuses to keep them from <laughs> building passive income because i know they're out there 
Yeah, it's a joke that I heard. Uh, Napoleon Hill's wife, I don't know if you heard this, uh, and if you know Napoleon Hill, he wrote uh, Think and Grow, Grow Rich. Rich. Uh, his wife, his widow, uh, has come out with a new book. Have you heard about this, Clayton? No. It's called Don't Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that that's kind of what stops a lot of uh, a lot of these investors. And obviously, that's a joke. But um, the you know what stops a lot of people from getting in the game is not buying that first one. Once you buy that first one, it's so much easier to buy more and uh, so much uh, more comfortable. And 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 your risk is so little. You know, owning one little rental property. So uh, don't think too much about it. Right, just do it. You know, do it with someone you trust. Uh, do it in areas that you trust. Uh, make sure, obviously, that you're making money uh, on it, uh, even if it's a little bit. Just, just you know, don't think and just grow rich. And, and, and again, dollar cost averaging. You know, you don't have right. to go out there and spend a million dollars today. Just dollar cost average. Buy a house a year. Buy a little here and a little there. Um, you're always going to be better off in the long run uh, with the buy and hold strategy. Awesome. Well, thank you, Pat. Great to see you. And thanks again for having me on your show. We'll link up my episode the uh, where I was a guest on your show in the description below so people can check that out as well. My guest has been Pat Hyben. Great to see you, my friend. Thanks, Clayton. Fun thanks, times. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for downloading and subscribing. We really appreciate it. Our whole goal with this channel is to help you build financial intelligence and to help you become a passive income investor. I love buy and hold real estate. That's my favorite way to do it. So make sure that you take action and go and do it yourself. Check out that link, by the way, at morrisinvest.com pat so you can get that free book. We'll see you next time, everyone, here on The Big Show.